that um, some time ago, the thing that stood out to me uh, in, relative, in relation to the problem that I see exists in the church, not just from the leadership, but many of the uh, rank and file members, and we see this played out across our country, is a lack of conviction to stand what they say they believe, stand for what they say they believe. Um, you know, some time ago I heard a message called conviction versus preference, and I've remembered often the things that the pastor talked about, and I've used that to, uh, to make decisions, because often we make decisions based on preference, not conviction. And we find that as the more America does that, the more American people does that, especially those who name the name of Christ, make their decisions based on preference over conviction, we find ourselves in more and more dire straits. So if, if anything is going to improve, it's going to start with those who call themselves Christians, those who say they love the Lord Jesus Christ, to start taking a stand for everything that they say they believe, not just things that are comfortable. And often, we find that there are some things we can take a stand on that we will find a lot of camaraderie. But there's times when you have to take those uncomfortable stands. And sometimes you're going to be standing by yourself. You have to make up your mind that even if I have to stand by myself, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it with boldness. And it doesn't really matter who doesn't, who doesn't like what I say. Because in the end, you have to know before you take that stand, whether or not you're truly right. Very well said. I see, I see in this dialogue discussion that the trajectory is leading to end time. This is where we are, people, and I don't think we're ready to fully accept that. Because when we fully accept it, there's going to be a change. That's the only way we can take on a spirit of fearlessness and being bold as a lion. And we're not being that right now. Ma'am, you had a question? Just come over here. Okay, go ahead. That's fine. Thank you. I'm Susan Fletcher with the Texas Faith and Freedom Coalition. And I just would like to encourage everyone to go on to ffcoalition.com to tag, tag team on what Ken had said and what Robert had said. You know, the, our pastors are not speaking out the way that they should. And we have a link on there that says what is legal and what is not legal. It's very clearly defined. It's a PDF that you can download. You can print it off. You can take it to your pastor and say, look, we need to be speaking out on these issues. I would even venture to say if you're a Christian here today and you're not experiencing persecution on some level occasionally in your life, you're probably not speaking out of the people. So, you know, it's important that we all you know, live our faith out and get out there and, and speak clearly and all of that. So I would just encourage you, it's ffcoalition.com and there is a link on the homepage. Thank you. Um, ask yourself a question. Are you ready, are we ready for the coming increased persecution? How many realize that our government has purchased enough bullets to shoot and bend and buy them? Okay, hollow point. While at the same time they take want to take our guns, at the same time Obama releases prisoners because of because of money. Listen, I truly believe that America's already been sold. They're just setting up the cash-in transaction. And here we are as Christians trying to be careful when we ought to be radical. There's a time to be radical. But it's so hard to evangelize those who know they're already evangelized. See, we already have the truth, so you can't tell us anything. So it's kind of like we're neutralized. Because, oh, I, I, I go to the um, you know, I go to so-and-so church. Oh, yeah, my pastor is. More people know their pastor than they know who, they're, who, who Christ is. And I truly believe God is permitting and allowing America to be in a position right now for those who are goats to be separated from those who are sheep. Pastor has a special report. Um, he's going to make some comments on pastors and the position that pastors have right now the responsibility they have, but also the flip side of that, the silver lining in the cloud. Pastor. Yeah. When he's finished, well, you're going to see several special reports like this. There are three, 
three to five minutes. When he's finished, I'm going to come back. The floor will be yours for a few minutes for you to engage, ask questions, make comments. Then we're going to go to the next level. Master. The challenge is to do this in three minutes and with the uh, charge. We know you're a preacher, but God is not. <laughs> to do it in three minutes, so I, I'm going to tailor my remarks towards uh, what I was, uh, historically documented. Uh, the first question was the historical context of pastors during Five minutes, pastor. the, the revolution. Five uh, the revolution. Um, uh, David Bark has done the definitive work in this area. He has went back and has looked at history and has framed uh, the starting of our nation uh, with the spiritual movement that, that was uh, happening at the time. Uh, he asks and answers the question, what is the, the Black Road Regiment? The Black Road Regiment was the name of the British or the name that the British placed on the courageous and patriotic American clergy during the founding era of our nation. Uh, it was a pejorative name that was labeled upon them because they wore black robes. Significantly, the British blamed the black regiment for America's independence. In fact, when they sought to discover why it is that the 13 colonies had rebelled, they laid the blame on the pastors. Significantly, the British blamed the black robe regiment of America for America's independence, and rightfully so, for modern history, uh, historians have documented that, quote, there is not a right assertion in the Declaration of Independence which has not been discussed by the New England clergy before 1763. In other words, the concepts that, that frame uh, the, the ideas and concepts within the Declaration of Independence were framed by preachers as they engaged what was legal and what was illegal. They talked about it in the context of their faith. What does God say about these rights? Where do these rights come from? And they begin to frame the discussion and frame the context through which the rebellion took place. It is, a, it is strange today, David Barton goes on to say, that generations to think that the rights listed in the Declaration of Independence were nothing more than a listing of, sermon, of sermons, topics that had been preached from the pulpit in two decades leading up to the American Revolution. But such was the case. The listing of our concerns against King George that is in that Declaration were a part of the sermon uh, presentations that were made by many pastors during that time. And so pastors were engaged and they were involved in the forming of our nation through framing it through the grid or through the lens or the filter of their faith. So shall it be today that we do what we do as believers based upon who we know and what he has said. He goes on to say uh, this. But it was not just the British who saw the American pulpit as largely responsible for the American independence and government. Our own leaders agreed. For example, John Adams rejoiced that the pulpits had thundered and specifically identified several ministers as being among the characters, the most conspicuous and the more ardent and influential in the awakening and the revival of American principles and feelings that led to America's independence. So the question, what is the historical context? The historical context is that the, the move for independence of America was birthed out of a movement that took place in the hearts of pastors, Amen. who birthed it through the thundering of preaching. <laughs> the next question was the unique opportunity that pastors have uh, to lead at this moment. <laughs> I think pastors have a, a, an audience that comes to them every Sunday. And they have an opportunity to frame for them and to give them a perspective of what's happening in the public square as it relates to the principles that are within the context of Scripture. There are five issues that I believe that are on, the issue, uh, on our table today where we need leadership. There is a dearth of leadership in America today. 
in all of our institutions, that is the academic institutions, that is in the government, that is in the family, and men and women, that is also including of the church. Those are the four institutions that govern much of the actions of our culture, and we're not quite frankly seeing the kind of leadership that is needed in any of those institutions to address the challenges that we face in America today. The uniqueness of the pastor to lead is that he has an opportunity to frame in a contemporary context, we call it contextualization, to contextualize for the believer what is happening in our culture and why it's happening in our culture and what is the prescription in the word of God to the ills that we're facing in our culture today. Five issues that are on the table. Abortion, euthanasia, embryonic stem cell research, human cloning, and the redefinition of marriage are five issues where leadership has been silent in our culture today because political correctness has muzzled us on those issues. Now it's time for us to take the muzzle off and say, thus saith the Lord yes. concerning abortion, concerning euthanasia, and concerning uh, same-sex marriage. And it's not going to be popular because political correctness says it's unpopular. It is not right, it is intolerant, it is bigotry, it is all those pejoratives that they can come up with. But it is right in the sight of God. We have a chance to lead <coughs> the divine perspective into the public square as the prophetic voice of the kingdom of God. The third question was uh, the spiritual consequences of doing nothing. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. What we're witnessing is a do-nothing culture right now. And we are facing a tsunami of challenges and threats to our liberty. And if we don't respond, we will be wiped out. Hopefully this panel will discuss connecting the dots. The issues of the Second Amendment do not stand alone, but they stand in a series of threats that have been targeted against our liberty. But we have been successfully distracted, successfully disconnected from the power source, which is God himself, distracted by television and American Idol and, and the nonsense that's coming over television, the pollution that's coming over television. And many of us, men included, especially men, it's been a targeted towards men, because if this republic is going to be rescued, men must step forward and take the lead. But the sociologists and the psychologists on the other side know what it takes to distract men. I was at a meeting the other day in Fort Worth, and I'll stop. And I was up speaking about these lofty concepts and, and the necessity for us to respond to an urgent moment in our culture. And a guy drove by in a, uh, a huge van, and on the van he had a half-clad, good-looking woman uh, with her breasts hanging out and her hips hanging out, and all the men in the group, not listening to me, and went to the church. <laughs> and I told him, I said, you guys need to see, what you just experienced is a deliberate attempt to distract you from what is important. Satan knows more about us than we want to admit. That's right. And don't you forget, yes, he's defeated in the scenario of God, but he's a very powerful enemy. And he is indeed, he indeed recognizes his time is short. And we need to begin to start thinking differently. And I think if we don't, then the consequences are, we are finished. We are done if we do not erect walls of resistance against this tsunami that is heading our way.